As elusive as dreams are, we now have a better look than ever before about how we dream. Dreams follow patterns and are not infinitely wild. So we can look at the portrayals in film and TV and see if they get it right or if they get it wrong. Hi, I'm Rahul Jandial. I'm a neurosurgeon and neuroscientist, and I've written the book, This Is Why You Dream. I'm here to break down some clips of dreams in film and TV. First clip we're gonna look at is Inception. When we're asleep, our mind can do almost anything. Such as? Well, imagine you're designing a building, right? You consciously create each aspect. But sometimes it feels like it's almost creating itself, if you know what I mean. Yeah. That's fantastic. Sometimes it's almost creating itself. That's very important. We don't have to activate dreams and dreaming. It's stimulus independent, meaning we don't have to kick it into gear. Dreams arrive, they arise without our intention. So that's spot on. Yeah, like I'm discovering it. Genuine inspiration, right? Mm -hmm. Now in a dream, our mind continuously does this. We create and perceive our world simultaneously and our mind does this. Absolutely, we create and perceive our world. We are the creators of our dreams. Now that might seem like an, a self-obvious or self-evident point, but for many, many years, thousands of years, because we thought the brain was inactive while we slept, it had to be from somewhere outside of our skulls that dreams arrived. Dreams now, we know for sure, arrive from the human brain. So that's excellent so well that we don't even know what's happening. That allows us to get right in the middle of that process. How? By taking over the creating part. Now this is where I need you. How could I ever acquire enough detail to make them think that it's reality? Enough detailed, uh, that's, that's absolutely right. When we dream, we create our dreamscape. The motor areas of our brain, the visual areas of our brain, they are active. It's not just imagination, it's actually down to neuronal activity. So waking thoughts and dreaming thoughts both fire up the brain. So I love what they're saying here. Well, dreams, they feel real while we're in them, right? It's only when we wake up that we realize something was actually strange. Now that one, where he says, it's only when we wake up, actually lucid dreaming is a type of dreaming, rigorously proven and spoken about since the time of Aristotle, where people develop an awareness they are both dreaming and aware they are in the dream. Sometimes they can even control the direction of the dream. So that might not be completely right. It's just a dream, then why are you... Because it's never just a dream, is it? And a face full of glass hurts like hell when you're in it. A face full of glass hurts like hell. Surveys uh, from thousands of dreams actually show we don't feel much pain in our dreams. The concepts of pain and body image are very different. I like where they're going with this, but pain is uh, not perceived to the same degree as in our waking brain. Five minutes? What? We were talking for like at least an hour. In a dream, your mind functions more quickly, therefore time seems to feel more slow. Five minutes in the real world gives you an hour in the dream. I like that. Five minutes while you're awake could feel like an hour when you're dreaming. Where does that come from? I'm not exactly sure, but a lot of people will tell you time is completely thrown off. Not just time, but clocks themselves. If you think about Salvador Dali's painting, clocks, the hands on the clocks and the numbers can be altered in dreams. So there's something there about time, how we experience time, how we even read time. That's all different in our dreaming brain. Not bad, a lot of complex concepts about dreaming and getting most of them right and making a movie that I love. So if I were to score zero to 10, 10 being most accurate, I'll give it a generous nine. This clip we're gonna watch is an episode from Friends. Tell me, I could use another reason why women won't look at me. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Last night, I had a dream that um, you and I were uh, doing it on this table. <laughs> <laughs> wow, they start off with uh, quite the scene. Now, two things about erotic dreams. One, they tend to be with people close to us, friends, sometimes family, and even bosses. So that's an important take right there, is that it's in her peer group, it's in her friend group, 
that she had an erotic dream about. Number two, although the group tends to be small and narrow and close to you, the acts reported can be quite wild. So maybe that's where they're coming in with, you know, they were intimate on that table. Interesting, because in my dreams, I'm surprisingly inadequate. <laughs> well, last night, you seemed to know your way around the table. I love it when we share. <laughs> I love it when we share. For therapists and others working on relationships, they find dream sharing is important. Not so much the content of the dream, but the emotional milieu, the environment of the dream, and the trust required to share that with somebody, sometimes guided with a therapist. So there's a whole space of dream sharing I think is interesting to look into. Come on, you told me about the last dream. No, forget it. Well, why not? Was I doing something particularly saucy? <laughs> Um, well, you were not the only one there. You know what? What? <laughs> there were times when it wasn't even me. <laughs> so that's interesting. I mean, the show is dated, so we have to take it into context here. But bisexuality in surveys of erotic dreams seems to be more common. I think if there is a link, when we bring more people with more diverse voices into these questionnaires and surveys, I think we'll have a better shot of figuring that out. So if we were to rank zero to 10, 10 being most accurate, how well this episode or this scene from Friends captures erotic dreams, I'll give it a six. The next clip is from Alice in Wonderland. The nightmare again. So that's, that's very important. The nightmare and the nightmare again. Nightmares are disproportionately found in children, five times as much. Children universally develop nightmares, and some of them can be recurrent. So this already is capturing something very important. Children have more nightmares than adults, and sometimes those nightmares can be a loop. They can happen over and over again. I won't be long. I'm falling down a dark hole. Falling down a dark hole. So clearly that's not a dream we want to have. And it's a nightmare if it wakes you up. Otherwise, it's just a bad dream. But falling is a common dream, and that's happened throughout the ages. Then I see strange creatures. What kind? That's fascinating to me. What we find in surveys are Children, no matter how gentle and kind they're rearing, they still have nightmares about creatures and monsters. And when they dream of animals, it's not their pets, they're beasts. So I, this is a fascinating portrayal of nightmares in kids. Nightmares in adults are a bit different. Of creatures. Well, there's a dodo bird, a rabbit in a waistcoat, a smiling cat. I didn't know cats could smile. Do you think I've gone round the bend? I'm afraid so. You're mad, bonkers, off your head. That's not terminology we use now, but yes, aspects of dreamings would be considered psychotic uh, if they were carried out during waking life. The other thing I want to point out is nightmares arrive for children at a time when their imagination and creativity is blossoming. They arrive at the same time children are learning something else. They're learning that people's actions may not be their intentions. They learn to read other people's minds. They learn to put themselves in other people's shoes. This capacity is called theory of mind. Just like children and kids have to learn to walk and talk, they have to develop a sense of dreaming. They have to develop a sense of us versus other. And that happens exactly at the same times as nightmares. I wonder if they could be linked. But I'll tell you a secret. All the best people are. <laughs> it's only a dream, Alice. Nothing can harm you there. But if you get too frightened, you can always wake up like this. Ow! I find that riveting. That as parents, and I have three sons, we have to teach our children at some point it was only a dream. And that makes me wonder, 
before that time, are children confusing waking thoughts and dreaming thoughts? We may never know, but it points to the ability to dream is developed, it's learned, it's cultivated, much like other capacities such as walking and talking. If I were to score this zero to 10, 10 being most accurate, it's pretty accurate. I'd give it a seven. This clip we're gonna look at is from Rushmore. What about that problem? Oh, that, don't worry about that. M, wait, is, why? I just put that up as a joke. That's probably the hardest geometry equation in the world. I guess if anyone here can solve that problem, I'd see to it that none of you ever have to open another math book again for the rest of your lives. That's interesting. In the end, we're going to find out that the student is dreaming. But when you look at dreams as a whole, not my dream or your dream, but 10,000 dreams, very few people report doing math. And there's a brain science reason for that. We now know that because the executive network is dampened when we dream, and part of what executive network does is calculation, it makes sense to me when you look at how we dream what we're seeing is possible or impossible in a dream. So before they get deeper into it, I just want to let you know, math is highly unlikely to happen in our dreams, especially some of the most challenging math problems that are being presented here. Max, here to try it. I'm sorry, did someone say my name? <laughs> So there it is. In the end, we find out he's not in class. He's in church. And this is very interesting. If you're wondering, wait a second, you just told us that you can't really do calculation in dreams. Or very few people report it. What about all these scientific breakthroughs? It seems almost all of them are still visual based. So coming up with benzene, the chemical structure, the idea came from a snake eating its own tail. So it's rarely raw math, but a visual solution to a scientific question. The other interesting thing is, it's not about whether this dream scene is correct or incorrect, but that often people report being in exams or back at school many, many years since they've finished school. I think this may be because that's where a lot of intense emotional experiences happen and dreams are a hyper-emotional state, there may be some connection there. On a score of zero to 10, if 10 is an accurate depiction of dreaming, I give this a generous zero. This clip is from a movie titled Eight and a Half. Immediately, they start off with a feeling of claustrophobia, the subtle use of sound, and then the passenger in the car in front looks back with a gaze that's hard to discern what the intentions are. The terror is now undeniable. Suffocation, not able to escape from the car, locked in. <laughs> This is a nightmare. People's hands and arms out of the bus. And in dreams, something about hands are always challenging. In our dreams, our hands are not created the right way. We may have more fingers. And then here, the scene is clearly one of terror. Look at this man's gaze. The fact that it's not clear is something that adds to the fright. In nightmares, sometimes we lose the capacity to read other people's minds. We can tell, we can feel the intentions are evil even. But our ability to discern that is lost. It's called theory of mind. That is dampened in nightmares. It's hard to tell what people intend to do to us. I think that's the scene that's being set. <sighs> A feeling that maybe the terror is behind us. He seems to find an escape. The eyes continue to look at him. <laughs> Nightmare.
nightmares when they're described, there are moments when you feel like you're getting away, that maybe the worst is behind you. Hey, you, here you. But the nightmare has not finished with him. Just when he felt like he was escaping, he's snared. The terror returns. Giù definitivamente. He falls to his demise and then is woken up. And that's the last part of a nightmare is that it must wake you up. It must sear the terrifying experience into your waking memory. Whereas other dreams are hard to hold on to, nightmares are defined by the fact they wake you up and singe that experience into your waking memory. On a score of zero to 10, if 10 is an accurate depiction of dreaming, what you're seeing here is a masterpiece. I give it a 10. After watching these clips, the attentive director and writer, they don't have to worry about the complex nature of dreams. In fact, I think the best movies, the best art, kind of borrows from how we dream and the dreaming process. It's my opinion, but when I look at surveys and questionnaires and dream reports, there's a striking similarity with the way the best movies are built. The flashbacks, the jumping ideas, going from one place to another, from one emotion to another. Sometimes I wonder, are we creating art that mirrors the art we experience every night when we dream? Thanks for watching. Don't forget, you can get my new book, This Is Why You Dream, in hardback and in audio by clicking the link below in the description.